My name is Mike Delinsky and I'm with Taurus Ag Marketing. Today I'm going to be talking about a fungus called Serendipita indica and sold under the trade name Ignite in Canada. Uh, I'll do a little bit of an introduction um, about our partner uh, background on genes and uh, stress because basically that's what's involved. This product helps in uh, securing nutrients and up and down regulating genes to deal with stress. So uh, that's pretty important. I'll talk about the history and biology of this uh, fungus, some of the direct and indirect effects, and then a bit of a conclusion and some data on what we've got here for Canada. Our partner in this is of course, Premier Tech, uh, which sells a lot of products on the, under the active logo. And many of you that uh, are clients of Taurus will be familiar with the mycorrhizae and rhizobium that we've been supplying to the marketplace and, and Premier Tech has been producing for a number of years. Uh, they're producing some bacillus now and as of about a couple of years ago, two years ago, uh, they are fermenting Serendipita indica, packaging it and supplying it into the market in a liquid formulation. Uh, whether that's gonna remain or not uh, depends on whether we can come up with a dry powder or we can put an inferral application right at the moment it is applied as the seed dressing. Now I'll do a little bit of a background, talk about genes and stress before I move on to the other components. Now, when we look at a, at a field, and this is a, a canola field in Northern Saskatchewan, we can all accept that plants growing up on this hill, for example, are in a different environment than plants in the mid slope and probably plants down here in the toe of that slope. We know that the nutrient levels vary across the landscape. That's why farmers are now doing uh, zoning and variable rate seeding and fertilizing to try and balance out the fertility across that landscape and give plants sort of a uniform uh, foothold across that field. We know that when we run that combine over that field that the yields vary a lot. So these plants during the summertime are dealing with variations in nutrients, but also environmental conditions. We have roots growing in the ground. We have shoots growing in the air. And these plants are monitoring everything through sensors in their roots and in their leaves. And they're monitoring things like compaction. They're monitoring moisture. They're monitoring wind. You know, on the north slope, you get a different condition than you do on the south slope. On a level field, there's a lot of variability in the soil that you don't see until you take a look at how those plants are growing. So the question that is always intriguing is how do these plants deal with that because they're all genetically the same. So plants down here are dealing with a different environment and plants up there are dealing with a different environment. Every plant, in fact, even a foot or two away from each other is dealing with a different environment. And how they do that is up and down regulating genes to respond to the environmental census that the plant is detecting. So let's take a look at genes. And eukaryotes are organisms, including mammals and plants and fungi that have you know cell walls and a nucleus. So we're very closely related and some of the, the traits and genes are conserved across the eukaryotes. So when we take a look, for example, at Arabidopsis, which is used for a lot of the genetic work, it's a small genome, it's a small crucifer uh, that grows very rapidly. So we can do genetic work on that. So if we, we determine what a, a, a gene does in Arabidopsis, we can then take a look at what it does in the rest of the sort of major plants that we grow. And that's how we, we figure out what those genes do. They knock them in, they knock them out and see what the plant does. And then they can identify what that gene does and usually gives it a name. And I'll be giving you some of those in a little while. Now, we want to take a look at, at genome sizes because it's important, I think. For example, wheat, the entire genome of wheat is continuing to sort of expand. There's about 105 to 107,000 genes. Brassica napis or our canola, as we, we like to call it here in Western Canada. Is about 100,000 genes, whereas Rapa has 41,000. So you can see that we've had great progress in the breeding of Napis because it's got a huge genome, so it can do a lot of different things in a lot of different parts of the world 
and deal with issues. We take a look at barley, for example, which has a relatively small genome, probably not as great a potential to make it into a monster crop compared to what we've done with things like canola and adoption of wheat across the world. Rice is variable, hemp, potatoes, flax, chickpeas. Most of the legumes have relatively small genomes. If you take a look at even soybeans. So that genome really programs what proteins are going to be produced. And those proteins are generally used to deal with whatever environmental conditions the plant has to deal with. And they're up and down regulated as needed. Now, if we look at a plant, and the way a plant functions, of course, is very simple. It takes up solution that contains nutrients from the roots. It moves it up into the leaves, runs it through photosynthesis, taking carbon from CO2, kicking out oxygen as a waste product, and the water is used to fluidize everything and also to cool it. The sunshine is used to run photosynthesis. And if you think about all those ingredients that are necessary to grow a plant, the only we, thing we as agronomists or farmers have that we can control, maybe a little bit on water, movement on surface and so on, are the nutrients. So the nutrients combined with the, combined with the genetics are really the important part of growing a crop. I've always had this belief that if we can manage good nutrition, which will lead to good management of stress, the plants with your genetic machinery will do everything it can to produce that crop. Farmers as a whole have been very efficient at controlling diseases and a lot of the biotic stresses, but it is now the abiotic stresses that have everybody concerned. Excess heat, droughts, salinity, all water issues are becoming the major concern. And there are a lot of scientists around the world trying to figure out how we can fortify our crops against those environmental conditions. The other thing that's important is how the plant takes up nutrients and takes up water. First of all, the nutrients must be present, be fairly close, be available or be solubilized because it's got to be in solution. And most of us are familiar with that. It has to then enter the plant and then it has to move through the plant. So we're going to take a look at how that all happens. Because without all of that happening, you know, we don't have much of a chance. And remember, the plant lives in two different worlds. The roots live in the soil, the shoots live above ground. And the root can't feed itself because it has no source of sugar, which is basically carbon, except the shoot. So the shoot, when it's uh, producing uh, sugar primarily out of photosynthesis, it is moving it down into the root system, moving it up to the apical meristem. And the apical meristem with hormones is communicating with the root apical meristem because the two of them have to coordinate their growth. The shoot can't grow without the root and the root can't grow without the shoot. And when we close down the stomata that brings about the flow of nutrients and water up to the chute, we get huge stress issues that occur. And water drives everything. It is that loss of water called transpiration through the stomata in the leaves, and there's stomata on the top and bottom of the leaves, that puts suction on the root system and allows it to take those nutrients up. Now, one of the big problems we have when we get into stress situations, which are you know, largely having to do with excess moisture or too much moisture, we shut down the stomata because the plant has to do something in order to protect itself. When we do that, the oxygen and other kinds of molecules in the leaves and in everywhere in the plant go under stress because that oxygen that is a waste product and loss through the stomata is trapped without those stomata opening and CO2 can't get in. So the plant basically goes into limbo. But if the stress lasts for a long time, those oxygen molecules, in fact, become damaged in the electron transport system and the photosyn uh, photosystems become damaged and we get real problems. And I'll talk about that stress because 
If you pick up any papers today that deal with stress, and almost everyone does in growing a plant, we talk about something called reactive oxygen species, and that's going to be a major feature of this presentation, at least the beginning part. So how do plants get those nutrients? Well, <clears throat> here's a, a root. This is a wheat root. And you can see there's tiny little holes, which are the xylem and the phloem, which are the tubes that allow the plant to move nutrients up and down on the plant. The root hairs are growing right here in what's called the rhizosphere. And then beyond the rhizosphere, we can have symbiotic endophytic fungi like mycorrhizae and, and serendipita indica, which go beyond the root hair zone and can extract nutrients and bring them back to the plant in return, the plant giving it sugar, the carbon that, that all organisms need. At the same time, as these roots penetrate through the ground, they leave behind these sugar-coated uh, uh, cells that are used at the tip, or here at the tip showing the exudates that are can be exuded at the root tip in order to extract nutrients from the soil and perhaps put out uh, hormones. And also, uh, the plant can uh, efflux or push out nutrients that are toxic to it through the cells back into the soil zone. And we can see that as the root grows, we get root hair starting to de develop back here and the root moves through the ground, uh, pushed by hydraulic pressures. And along this entire root, we get lateral roots that are put out, which then can feed into the main system. And as the plant grows and needs more root system to support the shoot, those things expand. So <clears throat> one of the <laughs> real problems in a lot of the uh, dealing with this for, for you guys as agronomists, uh, guys and gals, I should uh, be appropriate, is, is you can't see this stuff. Everything I'm talking about is taking place within the cells or in the roots and, and underground, and you don't see it. All you see are, are the results of all the activity that's going on within the cell. So I, I like to talk about this for farmers and, and agronomists, and I, I have been doing it for about seven, eight years now. And it's uh, becoming more and more evident that the importance of, of the genetic, you know, I guess, quality of the plants in terms of uh, being able to deal with ex extracting nutrients and dealing with stress is now the focus of a, of a lot of research. So what we, what we know is that within the cells, there are, are proteins that are called, we'll just call them transporters. And there are, are different proteins and they all have names. For example, we can see nitrate here, ammonium here, sulfate here. So there are transporters for each one of these kinds of nutrients and they all have names now. And I'll, I'll be going over, as I mentioned, some of those. So these transporters are up and down regulated as the plant senses it needs those nutrients. And they sit in the roots. The plant can also do some structural things. It can actually change the angle of the rooting system. And things like phosphorus especially drive that. So, so it can increase the hair lengths, it can increase the root lengths. And those all add to the success of the plant because if the root is in moving through the soil, the root hairs, you know, only last about five, six, seven days, depending on the conditions. It can access new roots, uh, sort of new nutrients, and it can access water. We also know now that we have these uh, proteins called aquaporins in the plasma membrane. Whenever you see these double blue dots here and, and fats in the middle, that's the plasma membrane of the cell. We have them as well in, in human beings, so, so our cells control everything. And basically, these transporters control what's going in and, out, in and out of the cell and in and out of the vacuole, which is the storage component within the plant cell. So if we take a look at uh, this plasma membrane, besides aquaporin sitting in there, we have all these transporters for different uh, nutrients. For example, this is a phosphate transporter. So if a plant needs phosphorus, what it can do is it can put some carboxylates into the soil zone to kick off the uh, cations off the cation exchange, which then becomes soluble in the solution and can be picked up by the transporter and taken into the plant. Now, some at the same time, we can kick off some not so good things. We can kick off, for example, aluminum and iron at low pHs which then, you know, will attach to things like phosphorus and 
become insoluble and be taken out of the system for a fairly long period of time. At high pHs, we can have tie up with calcium, which becomes an issue. And then we also have transporters in here and enzymes that can change the, the valence of nutrients so that the plant can in fact take them up. So that's all going on and we can't see it. And the plant just does it. It's kind of like we eat. We don't think about our food being digested. Our system just does it. This is up and down regulating just based on their own innate genetic capabilities. Now we've known and we talk about this, this combination of, of interactions. And in the soil, we've done a lot of work on chemical analysis of soils. Uh, and you know, a lot of the soil, soil scientists have been chemists. The biological component has been really lacking and it's only till recently till we've got PCR and, and metagenomics that we've been tackling, understanding the biological components in the soil and what those microbes do in relation to the soil and the plant. And uh, I guess we, uh, it'll be interesting to see, we, we just uh, finalized a deal with uh, trace genomics in the United States and we've collected about 500 soil samples across Western Canada this fall and looking at all the DNA extraction and identifying the pathogens and the beneficial organisms that we have sequenced in those soils to provide benchmarks for the populations, quantitative populations of both pathogens and good organisms in our soil. So that, that uh, package of soil nutrients and DNA analysis will be coming out under a, a sort of a brand name of Taurus Complete for analysis. So that is available now and we're finalizing some of the benchmarks uh, based on our, our Canadian soils. So as we move forward and we talk about plant health and soil health, we'll get a better understanding of microorganisms and how they interact with the soil and the plant. And we'll get a, a feel, a much better feel about how we would look at rotations and what crops were seeding in which quarter section or which section of land based on actually what we have there from microorganisms. We also will have some ability to understand the cycling of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil that is re requires microbial activity and almost all the availability of nutrients is based on microbes growing in the soil and around the root. And it's pretty clear now that the actual uh, rhizosphere right around the root is, is controlling what microbes are growing there. Because if you look at what's there, it's different than what's in the bulk soil. So we're, we're basically at the beginning edge of, a, of an iceberg with just a tip showing, but I think we're gonna progress quickly just as we are in human biology, where we can now analyze the gut microbiome of humans and are beginning to understand how important they are. Now, <clears throat> I'll, I'll show you two slides here now. And this is uh, Serendipita indica. And you can see this is the fungus growing in the soil, but it also, of course, it originates here in the plant. So it lives out here in the external uh, radial mycorrhizae, or mycelium and the internal radial mycelium. So it grows in there. So if a plant is sending a signal that is recognized by the fungus, the fungus has transporters. And here we'll use sulfate as an example. And there's two kinds of transporters for most nutrients. They're called LATS, low affinity transporters, transport systems. Come on. There we go. My mouse isn't working here. LATS and hats, high affinity transporters. So if we've got a good supply of, of, of sulfate, for example, we can use low affinity transporters and shut down the high affinity transporters because this takes a little more energy. But if the plant is short, we can upregulate these high affinity transporters and bring in a lot of sulfur through the mycelium into the root, uh, sorry, yeah, into the cell in the root and then pass it on to the plant which can then assimilate that for growth. So that's how that works. Here's a little simple diagram that shows you how a plant can deal with salinity, for example. We have transporters in here, SOS, salt overly sensitive, which can kick out sodium, for example, here. We have this transporter, sodium uh, hydrogen antiporter, which can move sodium from the cell plasma into the vacuole. 
where it can be stored because vacuoles are kind of like a fat cell they can expand and, and shrink and and if it's a toxic material it can go in there and be protected uh, or, for, or protect the cytoplasm of the cell by storing it and then we can kick it out when when there's space and then the plant can actually move it right out through the root system and we have a lot of hormones that are involved in osmolites to protect that cell and we get growth and we get stress adoption that's generally the way it works for everything and you can see we have these sensors here and it's interesting we we talk about calcium and what it does in the plant but calcium is really really strictly controlled in the plant and it's controlled in the vacuole and uh, in the cytosol all the time because when the sensor receives something the first thing it does it puts out a blast of calcium and that even applies when when a, a symbiotic relationship is taking place when they interact they have to accept each other and when the plant does that it puts out a burst of calcium which signals to the rest of the plant and the cells that there's going to be a symbiotic relationship here and it starts the process of acceptance the same thing holds through with pretty well all the transporters it's the calcium that is exuded so that's why it's got to be regulated and then a cascade of events takes place and we get up and down regulation of genes and changes in metabolism in the plant now we, we can't go on without looking at the nutrients and if you take a look at you know 20 or so nutrients that are, are key they're called essential a couple of things to note you can see that most of the plant is made up of carbon hydrogen and oxygen only a small amount is made up of nutrients and this is what we can supply to the plant and these are the big ones here in nk calcium phosphorus magnesium and sulfur by generally the volumes that are required here nitrogen the most because you know all the proteins are made from nitrogen the dna can um, a lot of nitrogen dna can uh, includes phosphorus and, and sugars so before we do anything the plant has to build a cell so the components that are used for building are really major after that we process things in the plant and things like magnesium sulfur and calcium are involved that in those in terms of developing proteins sulfur is key in terms of two of the amino acids that have sulfur in them you know magnesium is important in terms of photosynthesis this group of compounds called the transition metals are important for enzymes and catalysts in the plant iron manganese zinc copper molybdenum and nickel are key in terms of stress management and scavenging of what are called reactive oxygen species and you can see that serendipity indica si stands for serendipity indica also picks up nitrogen potassium calcium phosphorus magnesium sulfur boron and zinc so the fungus really supplements what the plant needs because being eukaryotes just like humans we need all of these nutrients so do the fungi so the fungi have evolved as a eukaryote over time with the same needs as we the human being the cow every animal in fact if you think about it for just a sec we eat plants or we eat animals that eat plants to get all the nutrients we have and the plants give us the oxygen take in the co2 without plants there would be basically no life on this earth now we'll go on to stress what is stress any unfavorable condition that interferes with growth and we know lots of those for example when we get stressed we get this stress response which gives out these reactive oxygen species where those oxygen these are those oxygen molecules that are damaged and that interferes with photosynthetic activity plant growth and yield and it interferes with these excess temperature causes stress excess light causes stress excess heat causes stress excess water causes stress excess cold causes stress loss of nutrients causes stress because the plant can't deal with them without the nutrients so there's lots of things that cause stress and we get abiotic stresses those from the environment and the biological ones are called biotic stresses and a biological like serendipita indica can help deal with both of those in harmony with the plant
So here are those stresses, heat, chilling, drought, water logging, salinity, uh, radiation on the plant, and we get the reactive oxygen species, which cause active, uh, stress, and it causes lipid damage, protein damage, DNA damage. And I'll show you those in a minute, but let me just go through these quickly. Reduces antioxidant enzyme activity. I'll be talking about those. Disrupts photosystems one and two. Disrupts photosynthetic enzymes. Excess heat will damage those enzymes in the photosystems, causing those reactive oxygen species to be produced. Reduce stomatal conductions, closing. Reduce membrane fluidity. Those aquaporins and so on can't work properly. Water loss increases as the plant tries and tries to deal with with the heat because it needs needs water loss to control heat in its leaves. Impairs exchange of gases because we know that the stomata are opening and closing and when they're closed, that's damage. We get hypoxia or lack of oxygen when we get water logging. Plant roots die not because of the water. They die because they can't get oxygen. Water does not transmit oxygen and they run short of oxygen and hypoxia is the death as a result of shortage of oxygen. We get hormone imbalances, heavy metal stress, poor growth and yield. And it's dealing with all of these, the combination of the plant and the fungus, the biological, that gives us either poor growth or good growth and yield. This is a, a little more complicated, but basically the same thing. And I wanna, I'll be leading up to what the actual plant does in, in more detail. But what we have here always is a signal that affects the gene upregulation, and that signal comes from the fungus. And, and to tell you the honest truth, the exact mechanism isn't fully known. That has mitochondria problems, it has chloroplast problems, which gives us these free radicals here. And then we get systems of antioxidants, ascorbic, dealing with glutathione, which is a sulfur compound, Ascorbic is vitamin C, and we have something called the ascorbic glutathione cycle, which helps to get rid of those reactive oxygen species. We get osmoprotectants like proline and glycine betins that are there to provide osmotic pressure control in the cells. And proline is usually a, it's an amino acid that first applies. And we get abiotic defense, and we get defense against biotic organisms. That's scavenging and we get a plant response. It's just about that simple and it happens in basically all eukaryotes and in a very similar fashion where, you know, we as humans are a little more advanced, we think, than plants, but it's the same process. So we get salinity, drought, heat tolerance, and we get defense against fungal organisms that are biotic. And here's just another example. Here's the mitochondria chloroplast, the peroxisomes are where we can finalize that process in plants. And this just exemplifies, we get membrane damage, DNA damage, chlorophyll damage in plants because plants have chlorophyll and, and other eukaryotes or mammals and reptiles and so on. Don't. And we get protein damage. And if that carries on for too darn long, we get cell death. That's what occurs. So just to review, because this is really the important part, the antioxidants. And we hear about this. Your wife will know about this if you don't. She knows about those colors, the keratins in blueberries and raspberries and carrots that are important as antioxidants. Vitamin C, ascorbic acid, plants will produce it automatically. Humans can't produce ascorbic acid, vitamin C, we have to eat it. That combined with the glutathione, which is a sulfur compound, is really key to the scavenging of those reactive oxygen species. Phytochelation, uh, these are proteins that can protect the plant against heavy metals. Tocopherol, vitamin E, and those carotenoids, these enzymes, superoxide desmatase, catalases, peroxidases, all of these things scavenge those free radicals. These are solutes that are upregulated in the gene to protect the folding of the proteins so those proteins aren't damaged. And all these hormones are talking back and forth to each other to help the plant and are upregulated as well by the interaction with Serendipita indica, 
Go figure. And we get homeostasis. Remember those transition metals I talked about? Manganese, iron, combination of copper and zinc, and nickel are what are called superoxide desmutase. They are the ones that actually bring about the production of, of hydrogen peroxide and break that down uh, through other mechanisms, but we, we can't go through everything here in, in one foul swoop. But it helps get rid of those and convert them into water. Now we'll go on to Serendipita indica. That's the basics. And this fungus is involved in manipulating that whole mess. Now this organism was found in the desert of India. And I don't know if they found it again, but it was discovered in 1997, that recently. In fact, the, the taxonomy of it has actually changed and Serendipita may in fact become a, a whole new class. I, I'm not sure, I can't find all the details on, on this. But it grew up and, and evolved in a really, really harsh climate in the desert over a long period of time. And that's maybe why it has so many characteristics in terms of beneficial components that will work with the plant because it's had to do that in a harsh environment. And it can increase resistance to biotic and abiotic stresses, all the stuff we've talked about. So, you know, there's a lot of work going on here in Canada with Premier Tech. Uh, their scientists there are continuing to work with this to expand the host plants that, that may be uh, important to us. Uh, China, India, a lot of work going on there in terms of trying to deal with stress in plants and other places in the world. I've probably read 50 or 60 scientific publications and all these tables and graphs and so on that I'm showing you are coming from the scientific literature because, of course, uh, I don't do any of the research myself uh, and neither does Taurus. We contract everything out and we're mostly interested in how the plants respond to this in terms of crop productivity. Some people call plant serendipita indica a plant probiotic. Uh, well, that may be exactly what it is. So this was discovered uh, in, a, in a batch of mycorrhizal spores, of all things. It's an endophytic fungus, which means it, it lives within the plant, and it's symbiotic that there's a, an exchange of nutrients. It used to be called Piriformospora indica, which is a difficult genus for me to pronounce. So Serendipita indica is the same thing. So in these slides, you'll see Piriforma here as, as um, uh, Pyromospora uh, listed, which is really now is just a uh, Serendipita indica. And here is another Basidiomyces within this family of, of uh, fungi. And some of them you'll recognize are, are mushrooms. So there are about five or six different classes or orders uh, or groups of, of fungi, asco. Um, Basidiomyces, Ascomyces, and a whole bunch of other ones, which uh, I'm not a mycologist, that's for darn sure. Now you can see uh, the spores right here, right in the root hair, uh, uh, can be developed and they can develop right here in the system. You can see root uh, or spores here. And then those spores will germinate and send out hyphae, uh, which become mycelium into the uh, soil biome. Uh, you can see the spores right in here. They actually get it uh, grow. Uh, the fungus enters the, the root and then uh, will sporulate and then those spores will put out uh, the hyphae into the uh, rhizosphere and beyond. Now the cool thing about Serendipity indica, and it was originally being developed for canola because canola hasn't got mycorrhizae, uh, neither do any of the crucifers, and neither do the kinopodiums, which are beets, uh, quinoa is a quinopodium and, and buckwheat, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I think it is. Uh, they don't seem to have a mycorrhizal relationship. Uh, but Serendipita indica will, will inoculate very well in, and develop a partnership with all the crucifers and the quinopodium. So it has a much, uh, it has a, a spectrum of colonization of some of the plants that we haven't been able to get to use uh, mycorrhizae, uh, which we have a, a good. Uh, supply of mycorrhizae that works very effectively with rhizogam in terms of legumes. And, and this product will be targeted for uh, other crops that don't have mycorrhizal relationships at this point in time. 
So what are the direct and indirect mechanisms that occur? Well, the direct mechanisms are mostly nutrients are taken into the plant. The indirect mechanisms are the interesting one. Induce plant gene transcription, stimulating growth. So let's take a look see at that. If we look at this, uh, we've divided it here into direct and indirect mechanisms, and you get the arrows here, which tell you that nutrient uptake occurs. We get a change in terms of the exudates, for example, that can be, uh, be produced by the plant to help improve growth. Nutrient solubilization, we can help solubilize those nutrients so that the plant can access them, and we can downregulate heavy metals. We haven't, I don't believe, looked at flax, but where there are some heavy metal issues with flax, there may be some benefit to using uh, uh, serendipity endica to reduce that metal, met, uh, heavy metal uptake. It's something that we, we got to look at, and I don't believe we have. Now, when we look at the indirect mechanism, that's a lot more complicated. So let's take a look at changes in the, in the actual host. We get modification of the genes, and that, that we'll talk about that secondarily. We get antioxidant production, we've talked about. We get secondary metabolites, those prolines and uh, beta and gly glycines that help the plant. We get downregulate of, of anti-nutrients. We get protection of the chloroplast, an increase in chloroplast content. We get root growth. At the same time, we get hormone regulation and we get regulation of um, gibberellic acids, ethylene, cytokines, oxygens, uh, and again, gibberellic acid to interfere uh, to affect flowering, root growth, and root colonization. In fact, these hormones are important in terms of the colonization of the root itself, and that then leads to better growth. So if, if we have that going on in dealing with stress system, we have mineral transport, we have fatty acid, biosynthesis genes upregulated, and that is why we, we have been consistently, consistently getting an increase in oil in canola. And this would apply more so to probably fatty acids and oil seed crops than they would in cereals, for example, that don't have nearly the high level of fatty acids, but cereals have some fatty acids in them for sure. We get uh, uh, phytochelation, which we already talked about. We get met uh, other metabolism related genes that are upregulated to increase metabolism, and we get photosynthesis upregulated because of root growth and so on. We get water upregulated, and we get better improvement in productivity. So if we control nutrient uptake and we control to some degree the mechanisms in the plant, we've got things working together. And I just threw this in to show you that all of these hormones are involved in signaling transduction, in bene uh, the beneficial symbiosis process, plant defense, and plant growth. And this whole process of crosstalk between uh, hormones is really, really gaining a foothold now because things like jasmanic acid, JA, and salicylic acid are really key to the biotic components of plant defense against microorganisms. So it is that crosstalk between all of these that basically influence gene up and down regulation that is really gaining a lot of uh, traction now in terms of understanding that and, and how we might be able to manipulate that for productivity. Now let's take a look at what really happens in the plant here in a, in a, a bit closer look. Nutritional aspects. So we have here, we have direct, this is part of the direct. We act, the plant or the fungus takes in directly iron, phosphate, sulfate, a whole bunch of other nutrients that have now been added to this particular list. And we have the high affinity sulfate transporters, and we have phosphorus transporters, which are here, and I'll show you that in a minute. And I just bring this up again. We've talked about that. And those transporters hold through for all of these nutrients. We also get an upregulation of nitrate reductase. Uh, and the next slide will help with that. And these are the the, the phosphorus transporters, you can see there's PT3, 5, 6, and others, iron transporters, and this uh, yellow stripe transporters are involved in some of the metal transports. So the nitrate reductase is right here, uh, luckily I found this slide, uh, is not directly uh, involved. It, it's, 
it's not known how it is uh, affected, but it upregulates the nitrate reductase, but it doesn't, it isn't involved in the actual transport of nitrate. Now you can see here that magnesium, phosphate, sulfate uh, can be brought into the uh, to the uh, to the fungus and then given back into the cytoplasm of the plant cell through those transporters. With nitrate, which comes directly into the cytoplasm, nitrate cannot be utilized by the plant directly. It has to be reduced. So it, the nitrate reductase is the enzyme that contains molybdenum of all darn things as the catalyst there that is involved in the redu reduction to nitrite and then the assimilation uh, and then the reduction again to, uh, to ammonium, which then can be assimilated into the plant. So there's just a, a, a mechanism there to upregulate that to help the plant, in fact, deal with the reduction process. Abiotic stress. We've talked about this. This is the, uh, the protein for proline. These are proteins that are involved in dealing with stomatal conductance and water loss. And I won't even bother going through these. I see these in the literature, Dreb and Lee. There are all kinds of proteins that are well described. Now we have the, uh, the aquaporins here. We have the uh, um, plasma membrane intrinsic proteins which are the aquaporins that are involved in water regulation at the plasma membrane level and also at the uh, um, vacuole level. We also have these proteins here, which are a salt antiporter right here, NHX2, which is involved in the transport of sodium under saline conditions out of the plant. And the same thing with this one. And the SOS one is, is salt overly sensitive, is involved as we've pushed, uh, pointed out uh, in other places in moving, uh, dealing with salinity. And here are those uh, scavengers, those enzymes that are upregulated, so, sods, catalase, and the glutathione kind of aspect uh, created by those ROS, reactive oxygen species I talked about. Improved chlorophyll. Uh, within the chloroplast, we get ATP production, and this ATP synthase, this can be upregulated uh, in by the fungus. ATP uh, is key, and it's the production of ATP in the electron transport systems of the photos, uh, photo, uh, photosystems that causes stress, and also the uh, metabolism of carbohydrates in the mitochondria that causes that stress. So ATP synthase is the process to develop ATP and that's protected. And the photosystem, photo, uh, photosystems are protected uh, by these proteins. And whenever we have iron in the plant, we almost always have it hooked to sulfur. There's a, a sulfur iron binding uh, process. And these proteins, the PET-C and PETs, are involved in those. Like I said, they all have names, they've all been identified, and we can see that they're, they're uh, conserved across uh, various species uh, in the eukaryotes. And then we have seed quality. And uh, these proteins here are involved in fatty acids. So we've been fairly successful at showing almost a 1% increase in oil content in canola when we have Serendipita indica in the mix. Uh, so these are involved in, in, in uh, fatty acid production. And this particular one, FAE, is involved in the early stages of uric acid production. So if we can downregulate that, and that's what this does, as you can see, the area is downregulating these. Uh, this helps uh, some of the folks that are in the genetic process of developing canola varieties reduce ure uric acid. And I'm not, not a geneticist, if you're darn sure. So I don't know what they've done in terms of canola. Uh, in the beginning days to get rid of uric acid and glucosinolates. And then through that whole process, we get excess branching and we get uh, bigger yields. Now I wanna just go over a, a paper here coming out of China. Uh, and this is Serendipita Indica promotes growth, seed yield and quality of Brassica napis, which is our canola here. Cause it's kind of interesting for me to see that China and India 
You can see this is out of India, out of China, uh, are working these. There's a lot of work going on in Germany as well. So what they've discovered, and, and we've known as well, we get better oil quality, okay, lower glucosinolates, more mineral nutrition, higher yields, more seed numbers and heavier thousand kernel weights, early flowering, more flowers, and uh, more inflorescence, early bolting, as well as better developed roots. Well, if you get all that, along with nutrient uptake, I guess you got a pretty good chance of getting a reasonable crop. And that's kind of where we're going with, with this in canola, although canola basically comes treated in the bag. So uh, there are a number of farmers, mostly in the Peace River area of Alberta, where we've had uh, probably the best success in terms of adoption of Serendipity Indica uh, that are now treating canola. But we also are now finding that there's a benefit in other crops. And this is the Chinese data showing controls versus uh, indica. We're getting eight days earlier bolting, nine days earlier flowering, better growth altogether, and of course, in the end, better yields. Same thing, better root growth, better shoot growth, which if that is uh, true, which it, I believe it is, leads to a higher yield, of course. So here's some actual data from, from Canada. Uh, this is Premier Tech's work. Uh, they do everything under contract, so so they contract that out. We're getting about a two and a half per, uh, bushel yield increase across the board over 27 sites uh, over the last what five years, four or five years. Uh, so that that's not too bad, and it varies from year to year because we don't know when we put that seed in the ground what the yields and the stresses are going to be. So you can see that in the beginning we had. Uh, very few plots and now we've got lots of plots and we've got lots of field data so uh, we're ready for a larger expansion to all kinds of crops going forward and you can take a look at all those sites 20 sites here and you can see that some years we get a big response other years not so big a response but we get some response the return on investment is definite even in very i guess good conditions where we don't see that stress on the plants perhaps or it may be that really we get the extra bump when we have a really great crop and we get the additional help this is probably both it's up to the plant and it varies across the field of course so we got almost a one percent uh, oil content increase on durham wheat we're getting about a, a better bounce we're getting about 3.8 bushel yield increase over the last two years and here are the sites that we've looked at. And the, the beauty of, of what I see here consistently with serendipity indica is we always get a response. And you know, the honest truth is, folks, if you look at a field and you've got a split plot, you can't see a one, a two, a three, a four bushel yield difference. You just can't because the variability across the field eliminates the possibility of you being right. So it's only through actual design plots that we get the kind of numbers we have. Don't seem like a lot, but I'll tell you what, farmers are pretty good now at growing crops. So we're not looking at getting five, six, 10, 15 bushel yield bumps, because we're already getting 40 bushel kind of yield averages compared to you know, 15, 20, 50 years ago when I got into this business. So we're pretty good. So now we're scratching out that extra amount on top of, you know, herbicide tolerant varieties and, and minimum tillage benefits. Barley, we get a good response in barley. We have been getting good responses in barley because it's got a really poor root system in my estimation. Barley's pretty good at dealing with salinity. So I think there's a real good chance that if we uh, utilize serendipity indica, ignite with barley, we can deal with salinity quite well. So here we are, what do we got? We got an endophytic symbiotic microbe that interacts with roots and access to the soil biome. Gives us access to more nutrient, more water in a greater amount of that soil. Fortifying mechanism acceptable to society. We're not putting pesticides, we're not changing anything. It's something that works together. Improves crop growth, biotic stress management, resistance through symbiotic association with plant roots. Crucial role in nutrient mobilization, mobilization and improved physiology, physiological activity, enhanced solubility of inorganic and organic nutrients. 
easy to apply and cost effective. And lastly, if we think about it, we put this stuff on the seed, it colonizes the seed, and it helps with seed germination. As the plant starts to grow, the population of the organism also, this biological increases, and we start getting increasing, increasing seedling, seedling vigor. In the vegetative stage, we get increased root, dry weight, tillering, and then we protect it in the flowering stage, so we get more flowers and more panicles in things that have panicles and earlier flowering, and then we increase the seed and we increase the quality. And that's what we're want, wanting to do. We do that with our nutrients. We can do this now with biological products. And here's one that may fit and balance off some of that variability across the field and help plants deal with it in a broader scope. Anyhow, thanks a lot for participating and listening. Uh, I hope you learned something and always remember the plant knows what to do. But lastly, if you want more information, go to taurus.ag. And when you scroll down there, you'll find a 2024 product portfolio where you can look up all the premier tech products and all the other products that Taurus sells in the fertility market. Again, thanks for participating.